please clap your hands and receive uh, to this auspicious platform the founder of the Million True Life Ministries, Pastor Mark Ellis. Well, good evening. Thank you very much, Pastor Charles. It's really a great honor to be here. Once again, Resurrection Life, you've got done yourselves here at Idolite Place. Well done, give yourselves a hand. You guys are amazing. We really value our relationship here and we thank every single one of you. But more so, we really thank God for your heart. We thank God for the fact that your heart is open to seeing the boundless, limitless potential that God has put in every single believer. And even though many will try and cap this potential, many people will try and say, no, we can go this far and we can't go further. Um, there, there's this much available before heaven and then the rest is in heaven. It's actually a lie. It's all postponement theology. Jesus died so that it could be finished, not so that it could be continued. Amen. That's, uh, that's deep. <laughs> you see, the thing is, what you have to realize is that I didn't come to these conclusions one day. I came to these conclusions after a life of eight years of walking in this. I've seen everything from cancer to AIDS to the lame to the dead healed by the name of Jesus. Why? Because the name of Jesus breaks every chain. And the chains you think you have, they're but paper to His name. They're but paper. They are imaginary lies that the devil tells you to hold you back. And I hope that through the testimony you hear here tonight and through the teaching that will follow, that you will be encouraged because I believe, in all honesty, that we have touched, we have began to walk something of the Jesus life. And if I've, take one, if I've taken one step ahead of you and I can help you get to that one step, wouldn't that be great? We could walk that road together. Amen? Amen? Wouldn't that be great? That's what the body of Christ is there for. We're there to help you grow up in all things in Christ. Isn't that right? So I'm going to take you back in time and we're going to share some testimonies. How many of you are keen to hear some testimonies? Are you keen to hear some testimonies? Okay. Well, let's start with the first one. I'm actually preaching the gospel. That is a testimony. That, that is a testimony. My wife will tell you that I was done with church, man. I was done with it. It was a dead old thing to me. And it wasn't because I hated the church or God. It was because I didn't see any life in it. Because it was just pitch up, pay up, and go eat a chicken and potatoes, man. That was it. That was all there was to church. And the more I asked questions about where is the supernatural, where is the things that Jesus did, where is it happening now, where is it, the more I became that guy. You know that guy, the guy that comes to the home group and everyone's like, can you please not ask the question? <laughs> you know, not that question again, right? You see, I, I wanted answers, but no one was giving me any. And the answers I was giving were not satisfactory. How many of you have ever felt, no, that's just not satisfactory? You see, it's not satisfactory when I ask, hey, how come believers aren't laying hands on the sick anymore? And they say, no, that's reserved for the elders. Hey, it's for the elders and for the believers. It's not for one or the other. Don't, don't give me that. Come on, man. James 5 says, if anyone's sick among you, call for the elders. But it also says in Mark 16, believers will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. They're both true. Isn't that right? Yes. Now, how come should you call for the elders? Well, because the elders should be old enough to know how to do this. That's why they call called elder. Because they were older than you. Hello? Oh, yes. See, back in those days, when you called for the elders, you called for the more experienced ones. You called for the ones that walked the journey before you because you needed to get the job done didn't have time to waste. Go check, go check the context of James. It's written to young believers. It's written to encourage them to get results so they can see the results 
so that they can be encouraged to get the same results. I mean, what does James focus on? The first thing he deals with is what you say. Yeah. Is it right? He deals with the power of how you're tempted and what you give yourself to and what you speak and how the tongue is the rudder of life and how everything you have today is because you landed on the shore of wherever you were talking yourself to. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. You see, you have everything you've ever said. Good, the bad, and the ugly. It's a fact. And everyone says to me, no, it can't be. It's just semantics. And then they'll see something bad happen and they'll say, oh, this is going to be bad. This is going to be bad. And they'll say it over and over and over again. And when it does happen, they say, see, I told you so. And then I say, really, your words have no power. You see, it's so much easier for us to reinforce negative things. And this is what was going on in my life. In my life, basically, I was going by what I was seeing. Why? Because that's all I knew. And maybe, like some of you here, that's all you've known. Maybe that's all you've seen. You haven't seen the supernatural. But I had one problem. And that was when I was a young boy, I saw some stuff that I couldn't forget. I saw a deaf lady get healed. I saw a leg grow out. I saw some stuff that no one could explain. And so in my mind, it was edged forever that this stuff can happen. I just didn't know whether it would happen when I did it. How many of you believe God can heal? Everyone in the room? How many of you believe God can heal through you? See, you're not so sure, right? And that was the problem with me as well. Don't worry. It's okay. I'm here to take those old shoes off and put a new one on you. Amen. Amen? You're going to put the shoes of the gospel on. And it's going to be ready. You know? Be ready. <laughs> with the shoes of the gospel. Because what? Beautiful are the feet to bring good news. Right? Yeah. This is normally where I insert a joke about my shoes. But my shoes are fine. <laughs> so here's the thing. What I want you to understand is that... In my life, I had nothing from anyone that would tell me that I was special. Even though my parents, when they couldn't have children, said to God that if, my, if, um, if we could have a child, our first child would be dedicated to the ministry. They, they basically committed me to the ministry. How dare they, right? <laughs> right. They committed me to the ministry before I was even born. Well, consequently, God took them up on the offer and... Here I am, right? And soon after that, the floodgates of the blessings of reproduction continued. And I had another four siblings. And you can see why he was almost called Father Abraham. But here's the thing. I was the firstborn. And you know the firstborn always gets the hardest right. Come on. Let's be honest. We're all parents. We've all known that, right? Why? Because you learn on the first one, right? The second one, you realize to take it a little bit easier on the next one, right? And then by the time you get to the fourth and the fifth one, you're taking it so easy that the eldest goes, come on, that would, I would never have been able to get away with that. Isn't that right? Okay. But that's just because you're learning, right? As a parent, you learn as time progresses. And so for me, what ended up happening is I became the solution with the church, but yet my parents had committed me to God Okay, and that's about all that happened. They did nothing more than that. They just committed me to God. And I always had a desire to serve God, and I kept trying to serve God, and I kept failing miserably. How many of you have ever tried to serve God and failed? Oh, come on, be honest now. We don't want a bunch of lying Christians in here tonight. Okay, so here's the thing, right? We've all tried to serve God and failed. Why? Because often we've tried, we've tried to do this in our own strength rather than relying on His strength. Rather than realizing who we are and living from who we are, we've tried to live towards who we want to be. You see, very often we can look at Jesus and Jesus is over there and He's a shining example and we can go, oh, we've got to strive to one day be like Jesus. Well, I've got a secret for you. You were created to be like Jesus. You are already as much like Jesus as you will ever be. 
but you are learning how to live like Him. See, you have the capacity to be like Jesus. Now, I didn't know that. So what I ended up doing was, I ended up running to the altar call every single time. Now, I don't know about you, but as a young kid, I mean, I messed up a lot. So every week I was back there. Every week. Listen, it got so bad that the elders started chasing me away, saying, you've got to be saved by now. You see, because I thought that every time you sinned, you come to Jesus and He washes away your sin. How many of you thought that? Well, listen, Jesus isn't there to be your big sin washing machine. He didn't come to just wash away your sin. He came to make you brand new. He came to make you a spanking new creature, one that never existed before, of which He was the firstborn of many. Amen. He was the firstborn of many. Of who's the many? It's got to be you, right? You see, what Jesus was making a way for was that we would be born again just like He was raised from the dead. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. So here's the deal. When I realized one day that all of a sudden the truth of the gospel wasn't that Jesus wanted to take my sin away, but it was that Jesus wanted to make me a saint, a son, a believer, one with him, a new creature, then all of a sudden I stopped looking for Jesus at church because I realized I was the church and Jesus was living here. And he wasn't out there in a place somewhere to be found. And so instead of looking for him there, I brought him with me. And you know, people around me really appreciated it. Because I can tell you now, the parts of you that the world doesn't like are the parts of you that don't look like Jesus. It's, it's a fact. They loved Jesus. It was the religious people who hated Jesus. Not the world. Yeah, do you know the Romans wouldn't have crucified Jesus had they not been told to? The religious leaders told them that they need to crucify Jesus. Isn't that right? Yeah. Okay. So what ends up happening? I hear this message one day after my wife finally convinces me to go back to church about Jesus being the blueprint for the Christian life. How many of you have ever heard something like that? How many of you have heard that Jesus is the Word? Well, that's in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word, what? Came, Came to the earth and dwelt amongst us. Isn't that right? Okay, so Jesus is the manifestation of the Word of God, is He not? Yes. Alright. So you've established that the Word is a blueprint, and the manifestation of the Word is that blueprint in perfect manifestation. And guess what that perfect manifestation looks like? Jesus. Looks like Jesus. What did Jesus say you look like? The Father. The Father. So he said, if you've seen me, you've seen who? Oh, so if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. So the Word is a reflection of the Son. The Son is a reflection of the Father. Amen. And who's the one who reveals the Son? The Holy Ghost. Come on. Yeah. This is good stuff, man. So what I'm trying to tell you is I realized that Jesus was the blueprint for the Christian life. Why? Because Jesus was born of the Spirit. Isn't that right? The Spirit of God hovered over Mary Magdalene and she was impregnated. Isn't that right? Yeah. Okay. So Jesus was born of the Spirit. When are you born of the Spirit? When are you born of the Spirit? John 1. To all those who believed on him and called upon his name, he gave them the power or the authority to become the sons of God. Right? We were not born of the will of blood or the will of flesh or the will of man, but the will of God. So it's God's will that you be born of the Spirit of God. Isn't that right? Yeah. How many of you are born again? One, two, three, four. Okay, good. I'm in the right place. Thank goodness. Okay, so if you're born again, then you're born from the Spirit of God. That means you've just entered Jesus stage one, born of the Spirit. Stage two, G 
Jesus grows up, right? And he goes and is baptized in water. Now let me ask you, did Jesus need to be baptized in water? What was the baptism of water that John was doing all about? It was the baptism of repentance from sin. Well, how many of you would go and get baptized for the repentance of sins if you never sinned? Even if the Holy Spirit told you, go and get baptized, you'd go, but I never sinned. Isn't that right? But yet Jesus, in spite of the fact that he never sinned, became obedient to the Spirit of God and he went and he was baptized. Isn't that interesting? Okay, so watch what happens. Did Jesus have to be obedient to the Father in being baptized even though he didn't think he needed it? Okay, so in obedience he goes and he's baptized. What does the Father say to the obedience of the Son? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Isn't that right? And what happens? The Holy Spirit descends on him and it's like a dove. Okay? So then he becomes baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so have we got the three steps in Acts 3 here? What does Peter say? The people are cut to the heart and they say, Oh my, we have crucified the Son of God. What shall we do? Is that right? Yes. Okay, and he says, What? Repent, turn away, right? And be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sin. So, what was the baptism of the remission of sin? It was always water. Be baptized for the remission of sin. Is that right? Then he says, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is for you and for your children's children. Repentance, rebirth, and then the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Do you see that? Okay. So when I put three and three together, I got six. And I saw the same pattern in Jesus' life that I should see in the life of every believer. Did Jesus do any miracles according to the Bible prior to him being baptized in the Holy Ghost? No, no. No, not even turning water into wine happened before he was baptized with the Holy Ghost. Correct. Are you, are you with me still? No. Okay, I'm trying to show you what it was that completely revolutionized my thinking about Jesus. Because for so long, we have been taught that Jesus is God and we are not. Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. Now you it's right. Jesus is God and you're not God. But God has made you like Him. So if I say to my son, you can never grow up to be anything like me because you're just like me, you're not me. Is it a true statement? No, it's a lie. Isn't it right? It's not true. Just because someone can amass the same potential as me, doesn't mean they replace me. Correct. Isn't that right? Okay. So if I have a son, can my son have the same potential to do the things that even I can do? Yes. Can they? Yes. Alright. So what are you? Are you sure? You see, you've got to understand the difference between being God's son and the idea that there is a God to be replaced. Are you with me? We're not talking about replacing God or being God. So get that out of your mind. What we're talking about is that you get to be like God because he chose to make you that way. Now, is God allowed to choose to do things the way he wants to? Yes. Are you? Are you sure? Yes. So then why do you have a problem with that? He chose that. That was his plan. I've got this Bible here. I've read it. It's got stuff like that in there. I'll show you later. Is this making sense to you so far? Yeah. Okay. So what did this 
began to constitute in my life, when I began to realize that I was meant to do the things that Jesus did, scriptures like what Pastor Chuck read out to you earlier on began to stand out. Is that right? Yes. Because the disciples intended to do the things that Jesus did. Is that right? Yes. I mean, if it wasn't part of the program, do you think Peter would have insisted that he get out of the boat and walk to Jesus when Jesus is walking on the water? If Peter didn't have to, if, if it wasn't part of the program, why would he? The idea of a disciple is that someone is disciplined according to your lifestyle. Are you with me? Being a disciple of Jesus means you, dis you discipline your life according to the way that Jesus lived. You do the things that Jesus did. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. But if you want to be a disciple of the Pharisees, then you would do what the Pharisees did. Yes. If you want to be a disciple of, of I don't know, Tim Nock should be Bantam. I don't know, something like that. You get what I'm saying? Because you're following the way, you're, dis you're disciplining yourself according to the way that they live. That's what a disciple is. Someone who disciplines themselves according to a pattern of life. Jesus came to show us the pattern of life that we were always intended to live in. The created potential that we had from the beginning was manifested in the Son of God and it was demonstrated to us in Him so that we might see what we really were meant to be. Because yeah. we lost complete sight of it. And to a large degree today, people still lose sight of it. You see, Pastor Chuck read, he read out of Matthew 10, right? Yeah. I want you to go to Luke 6.40. Just before you think, I'm not going to use scripture tonight. Because that would be horrible, right? I, I hope you're learning something. Yes. Okay. Luke 6.40 says, A disciple is not above his teacher. Is everyone there? Mm -hmm. A disciple is not above his teacher. But every one, being every what? Student, every disciple, yeah? Every one, when he is fully trained. I want you to underline in your Bible the word fully trained. You know the word fully trained means when your training is complete. When your training comes to completion. Do you know that there is normally a process? Training takes a time in order to be completed. It doesn't happen in an instant. It's not a magic bullet. It's not a magic, a magic wand. It's not an incantation. Are you with me? It's a process of learning through which you attain the stature of what the master has through reason of exercise and practice. Through that discipline that you continue to enforce in your life. Is it making sense? Alright, so watch this. It says, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. Oh my. Oh my. Did Jesus just say you'd be like him? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Alright. So you can see that what this is the thing that was driving me. Are you with me? This is the thing that was driving me. And the whole church that it was in, this was the thing that they wanted to go after initially. And I say initially because over time, people, they get worn down. Yeah. See, the only difference between me and most of them is that I never gave up. It's not that I didn't hit hurdles or fall down or have to pick myself up. Are you with me? Or even hit failure or even had people die on me. It's not, it's not because that those things didn't happen. It's because in spite of them, I continued and because I did, amazing things happened. How many of you think that amazing things should follow believers? Okay. So what do, I, what do I mean by amazing? Well, it says these signs follow those who believe. Isn't that right? Does it say that they cast out devils? Yes. Yes. Does it say that they will lay hands in the sick and they'll recover? Yes. Yes, of course it does. So I want to give you a little bit of insight as to what happened soon after I began to understand this one thing. I am meant to be like Jesus and Jesus has made me in the image of God in true righteousness and holiness. 
This righteousness and holiness that I have been given is not dependent on how well I live. It's dependent on how good a job he did on my behalf. And because of that great job he did, I have now been given righteousness. So because of the righteousness I have, I have now been empowered to live it out. And if I don't live out righteousness, I deny the gift I've been given. So I wasn't set free to sin. I was set free from sin. So that sin would have no dominion over me, and so that I could walk in freedom because I'm empowered by righteousness and I'm empowered by holiness. Amen. Come on. Yes. You should get the audio. That was awesome. Yeah. So watch this. This truth was what began to drive me in the direction of doing the gospel. And so in the initially, we began to do the gospel by just calling people up who needed prayer for sickness or anything. And we were getting anywhere between 5 and 10% success rate. How many of you think that's great? I don't think that's great. It's okay. Better than nothing. But, but definitely not great. Right? How many of you reckon 50% would be cool? Like 50% would be okay. No? Okay. How many of you reckon that like, like 100% would be good? Yes. Would 100% be awesome? Yes. Okay, now the problem that we face is that we don't understand what the word knowledge means when we read our Bible. When it says that you may grow or understand or come to know in the knowledge of Him, it's not talking about understanding the words in a piece of paper. It's talking about actually tangibly partaking of Christ. Because it's talking about the word epinosis. Not, it's not just gnosis, it's epinosis. It means experiential knowledge that is gained through reason of use. Now, you can read all you want about the sports cars in the world if you're a sports cars fan. And you can tell people a whole bunch of things about sports cars. But if you're in the room with someone who drives a sports car, you will not have the sufficient knowledge. The person who drives a sports car will know what the difference is between the theory and the practical because he's driven one. Yes. A driver is different to someone who is just reading about driving. A guitarist is different to someone who's just reading about how to play the guitar. How to play the guitar. Are you with me? So there's an experiential knowledge you gain through putting something into use. And I never understood this. This was something that was, as you would say earlier, aloof from me. It was something that was away from me in the sense that I actually didn't know that this is how the mechanics of the kingdom could work. Why did Jesus take these men around with him for three years and show them how he did it? Why did he send them out and make them do it? Because you only really know how once you do. Correct. Correct. Okay, and we will cover that in detail. It becomes a cornerstone doctrine in the New Testament and everyone misses it. It's right there. And I'm going to show you how four different authors all said exactly the same thing to people in order to get them to start growing up into Jesus. It's going to be awesome. How many of you are keen for that? Amen. It's going to be amazing, right? So when I began to learn this, I realized that the only way I was going to get good at it is if I keep trying. But how many of you know that it's not just practice that makes perfect, but it's perfect practice that makes perfect? Amen. So you want to learn from the best in order to know what it looks like in order to get it right. Well, the best was Jesus. Isn't that right? Yeah. Okay, so but I can't like find Him because so few people are actually manifesting Him. Yeah. So I had to start looking around. Where can I find Jesus? And so I had to start finding Him in different people. Well, the people who seem to manifest Jesus the best in the area of healing and power, lived a hundred years ago. Smith Bigglesworth, John, John G. Lake, A. Allen, F. F. Bosworth, these people lived a long time ago. They lived a hundred years ago. I might have been that old yet. Yeah. So I couldn't even meet them. 
And probably if they did, they, they wouldn't have liked me too much. Because I heard that they, they didn't really like people all that much. Isn't it amazing how people like them a lot more when they're dead than when they're, when they're alive? I mean, John Lake said that it is always God's will to heal, and then people would say, well, prove it. Go empty out of the hospital. And so he did. Twice. They had to relocate the nursing staff. And we know people who are still in fellowship with us who have done that also. Why? Because Jesus is king. And he is not different today than what he was a hundred years ago. But a hundred years ago, that's all we, that's, that was the closest thing I could find. And so I thought, well, Smith Lewis is a bit violent. And because I'm quite a robust person, it would probably be even more aggressive if I ended up learning his style of things. <laughs> Try punching people, or forgive me, he never punched people. He, pen, he punched devils, people just got in the way. <laughs> so I, I realized that I needed to learn from someone a little bit, kind of getting the same results, but not as aggressive, right? I mean, that's a fair comment, yeah. amen? He got results, which is great. But so I decided John Lake would be a better bet, right? He got some really good results, and he's got a history here in South Africa, so I figured, hey, this is actually not a bad avenue. I can actually go down this avenue. So I searched for, um, for John G. Lake, and I found out that there was a ministry still around, okay? And it was the first time I found a Voice of Healing video talking about the fact that um, you can actually command healing and it can happen. It was the first time I heard anyone pray with authority in my life. Every time before that, whenever I read Jesus saying a command, I just couldn't imagine this half anorexic Jesus with a lamb in his arm saying, Come out! It, it just didn't compute. Yeah. But that was exactly what Jesus was doing. You see, Jesus wasn't, that picture is a European version of what they think Jesus looked like. That was not Jesus. Yes. Jesus was so common, they needed a common man to point him out. They didn't even know who to arrest. Hello? He wasn't, he didn't have special glitter all over him. He looked like everyone else. Messiah tells us there was nothing about him that we should esteem him. There was nothing about him that we should distinguish him from anyone else. He was as common as common you can get. For goodness sake, he was born in a stable. Yeah. Do you know why? Because he came to serve, not to be served. If only we could get the mind of Christ. He came to serve, not to be served. So watch what happens. Jesus, okay, he was so, so common, and yet we try and make him so, so otherly. Isn't that right? Yeah. And you know why? The more we make him otherly, the less we are able to identify with him as being normal. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And the less we identify with him, the less like him we act. Yeah. Because when Jesus is out of your reach, then your answer is out of the way. Because yes. Jesus is the answer. Yes. Do you understand? How do you stay in perfect peace? Keep your mind on Him. Who? Jesus. Those who keep their mind on Him will, what? Stay in perfect peace. How many of you want perfect peace? Now, see, it's not about writing all your problems down and telling everyone about how bad stuff is. No. It's about keeping your mind on Jesus. Do you know that a mind that is on Jesus is one that surrendered to the Father? And a mind that is surrendered to the Father is actively resisting the devil by default. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. It's not just resist the devil. You can resist the devil until you're blue in the face. I promise you now. You can resist him and resist him and resist him. And he'll keep coming back. Why? Because you keep thinking like him. You've got to change the way you think. You cannot resist what you agree with. Hello. Yeah. You cannot resist what you agree with. That's why you must submit to God, come into agreement with what He says, and then you can resist. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. 
So right after hearing this voice and healing video, I went to one of the prayer meetings at my church, and I was all excited because now I'd finally realized and seen that Jesus prayed with authority, and I could do the same thing. And so gone was this idea now that I had to, you know, ask God to try and do this for like half an hour and hope that one day He'd hear me be kind enough to do something. Amen? So I'm standing in front of a lady who's got like a very sore shoulder and she tells me she can't move her shoulder even over like this without excruciating pain. So I said to her, okay, well, let's do this. So I put my hand on her shoulder. The first time I've ever done this, like this way, okay? Every other time it's always been, God, please heal this sickness, you know, all those kind of prayers, okay? So I put my hand on her shoulder and I literally said, in the name of Jesus, shoulder be healed right now. Pain, go in Jesus' name. And then I took my hand away. And she continued to keep her eyes closed. She continued to stand there. And I continued to be concerned as to why this was taking so long. So I was standing there watching her, thinking I didn't want to be polite and say, okay, come on now. Right? Because... And all of a sudden, I realized my prayer was so much shorter than what most people were expecting. Yeah. See, I didn't realize how much shorter it was to do it this way. So eventually, I'm standing there patiently. She opens her eyes. And what happens? She opens her eyes and she says, Oh, I thought your hand was still on my shoulder. Hey, that's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> hey? So on the outside, I'm going, okay. On the inside, I'm going, yeah, come on. Right? Then she says to me, she says, well, what should I do? I said, well, come on, swing it. So she goes, wham, completely healed. Amen. No pain, no discomfort, completely healed. And it just popped like this. Bah. So then the guy who is playing the bass guitar, he ends up, right, screaming out to me as he sees this healing. And he says, Mark. I've been struggling with this head cold all day and I've got a headache right now. Can you get rid of it? So I'm thinking, we just got a win here, man. <laughs> like, we can do this. <laughs> I mean, isn't that right? Yeah. When you got a win, you're like, come on, we got a win. Let's go, right? Yeah. So I said, oh, sure thing, right? Sure thing. So I said, headache, go, flu, go. Now in Jesus' name. Just like that. Boom. Instantly his headache was gone. Just like that. Gone. He's like, whoa. I can feel it, it's completely gone. I'm like, yeah, inside I'm going, whoo, yes. I'm like, okay, so they're busy praying for a lady down the line, and she's got all these blisters down her throat, she's had these cold sores down her throat, and they've been praying for her, and I'm sure they've been getting some result, but they're still moving towards something, right? So they call me over, and I go and pray there, bang, all the cold sores gone. Now that about you, I've been counting, that's three out of three. <laughs> I'm going, glory to God. <laughs> Amen? But wouldn't you be like, I think we aced this. Yeah. So then this girl comes up to me and she needs braces. And all of a sudden, I can't put it, I can't put it in a sickness list. I don't, is braces a sickness? I mean, like, do we even pray for this stuff, right? I didn't know what to do with it. And I prayed for her anyway. Nothing happened. Why? Because I doubted. You see, I'm not going to lie to you. You don't have to think I'm someone special. Jesus is special. Amen. Amen. You see, one moment I was in complete faith. The next moment, bam, I was in complete doubt. Why? Because I didn't know where to put braces. I didn't know whether it was part of God's will or not. So you cannot have faith beyond what you know God's will is. And as long as you think God's will is a mystery, you, your faith is a mystery. Yes. You understand? God has revealed these things to us. He has not kept them hidden. He has revealed them. Now, many of us are still discovering what He's already revealed. Are you with me? So they're hidden to you, but they're not hidden in the sense that God is hiding them. Are you with me? All right. Okay. I know that there are, there are things that seem hidden that God wants us to uncover, but He is not hiding them from us. 
We have not yet uncovered what he's already given. Is that making sense to you? For example, how many of you believe that God has given the earth to mankind? Has he given the whole earth? Yes. Is all the earth yours? Yes. Okay, have you seen all of it? No. Then you haven't uncovered it all. You haven't uncovered it all, but yet it's all yours. And only once you uncover it all will you fully know it all. Isn't that right? And how long will you spend to try and know all of the earth? Quite a while, yeah? Hopefully you can live long enough. We're working on that. Hallelujah. So, but what's this? If you could, how long would it take you to get to know God? You see, you can have all of Him and not know all of Him because He's massive. Are you with me, church? Yes. Okay, hopefully this is making sense to you. So right after that, I realized, oh my goodness, this is amazing. I mean, I, the results just went through the roof. Isn't that right? Yeah. And after that happened, okay, my daughter broke out with a nappy rash. How many of you parents like nappy rashes? No one? So no one, no hands, no takers? Oh, well done. I agree with you. So no one likes nappy rashes, right? And we tried everything with this one nappy rash. Ever had a nappy rash like that where it just didn't seem to want to go away? Well, after we tried everything, I realized, man, this has to be like something more than just a nappy rash. Because this is weird. You know, normally these things would go away. You treat it, you know, it's fine. So I'm like, no, no, no. Okay, we're going to deal with this thing. I'm not going to keep, be kept awake all night. This thing's going now. So, I took the nappy off, and I began to command that rash. And I said, you go now, be healed in Jesus' name. You go now, you be healed in Jesus' name. And I kept going on like that. As I was speaking, I promise you, my wife was there. She will tell you, as I was speaking, the, the, the swelling started going down. The rash started disappearing with nothing on it, other than me just speaking to it. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Well, guess what? You can do the same thing. Yes. That's exactly what happened. My daughter, that day, was the last day she ever had a nappy rash. Amen. I'm not kidding. I'm not saying they didn't put cream on her. I'm just saying that was the last day she ever had a nappy rash. And they'd been using cream before, so that wasn't exactly the deciding factor. Are you with me? Yes. All right. My daughter was also diagnosed with infant's asthma at age two. And this was right about the time when we first began to understand what the Word of God teaches surrounding healing. So we were still very green and still very new to what was happening. Now how many of you know that when your children are ill, it's quite difficult in how to deal with the situation? Yeah. Isn't that right? So what I want to tell you is everything I'm sharing with you tonight comes from a place of eight years of experience of working it out. So I'm not expecting you to go home and do exactly what I can do today. But I am asking you to consider the fact that if Christ lives in you, you can start that journey today. Amen? 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 Because I started somewhere, and where I am today, wow, I'll tell you a little bit more about it later. Are you guys okay so far? Okay, this means voice takes so much longer. But they're good, right? Right? They're good, they're helpful, aren't they? So what ends up happening is with her, in this, you know, infant's asthma is a horrible thing, man. They say the nasal passages of the kid is too small. So when they get what they consider the normal flu that goes around, which I don't consider normal at all, Amen. and neither should you, okay? It's not normal. It's a devil. Just don't accept that punk, all right? So here's the thing. As it would come around, under, under what they would call normal circumstances, she would get phlegm, and then obviously she'd get fevers, and she'd start getting these huge fevers, almost to the point where she'd go into like, um, what do they call it? Um, a seizure, right? Because they get too hot. So what we would do is we'd wipe her down with a cloth, and we'd try to cool her down, and it's quite stressful, right? And we would then use the pump, you know? That was the, the whole situation. When I began to understand what the Word of God said, I began to put that into practice, and I said, no more, I'm not going through life with my daughter on a pump. That's not happening. Jesus is king. It's not going to happen this way. So I began to take my little girl and pray over her in tongues. And I did this because I didn't know what else to do. Was it wasn't because I was so smart. 
Okay? Just so you know, okay? God just met me where I was at. I wanted this thing and I wasn't willing to settle for anything less. Alright? And I began to pray with her and pray with her and pray with her. And I mean, it was amazing. She would have temperatures that spike. I would put my hand on her. I would command her to go down. I would start praying in tongues. Her fever would break. She'd come down. Then I'd wake up. Her fever would spike again. Then I'd wake up. I'd pray for her again. Her fever would go down. This happened for about, I'd say, two weeks. And after two weeks, she was completely free. She's now 11. There is no asthma. Okay, it left her age three, like it was gone. Are you with me? And I've seen asthma defeated everywhere I go. You know why? Because it got itself beat so bad, it doesn't want to stick around when I'm in the room. You see, Jesus is king, and now it knows it. Because I dare to believe that. Are you with me? You're not, you're not allowed to suffer with that stuff, man. That is not... That is not your portion. Jesus died so that you would prosper and be in good health. Amen. Amen? Even as your soul prospers. So tonight, your soul is prospering so you can prosper and be in good health. Amen? Yes. Okay. So watch this. This is what happened to my daughter. She got completely healed and set free. My daughter, out of just watching what I was doing, began to do very similar things. As she got older, my... <coughs> my um, Mother-in-law, no, we call her Nana, she fell down some stairs and really hurt her leg. And it was purple and blue. And Tahila, I think she was about five or four. Yeah, she was four years old. And she put her hand on Nana's leg and she commanded the pain to go in Jesus' name. And she got instantly healed. Instantly healed. A four-year-old could pull this off, man. All God knew needs is like an available vessel. Like, right? can you get out your way? It's literally all you're going to learn is how to get out of your own way. Because like this critical mind is too used to living by the world and not used to enough living by the word. We're going to change that. Is that cool? Okay, cool. So, so this, that's another test to me. Then I had a friend, his name was Anton. He had um, a problem in his back. Okay. Man, you guys are going to get like bombarded with testimonies tonight. Is that okay? Okay, so he had this problem in his back where they had infused certain vertebrae so he actually couldn't like bend over and do certain things. So we prayed for him until he could. Amen. <laughs> and now he can. <laughs> and Jesus is awesome, right? Okay, then we were busy um, together, we were busy preparing this floor and we had to clean it. So we had to use like a special acid. Have you guys ever like used an acid to clean a floor? You're not supposed to get that stuff in your eyes, right? Okay, well, anyway, <clears throat> what happens is we're busy cleaning and some of it splashes onto his hand and without thinking he rubs his eye and like he gets a decent amount in his eye, like I mean a decent amount. And he's like, no, 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 it's not supposed to get in my eye. So we grab a bucket of water, obviously that's what you do, you know, you throw water on it to try and get it to neutralize. But I mean, even like 10 seconds is like irreversible damage, like in most cases. So we throw the water on it, I put my hand over his eye, and I'm like, right now, all damage, be undone, be healed in Jesus' name. And he opens his eyes, and now that eye is better than the other one. <laughs> Come on, man, Jesus is king. Do you understand what I'm telling you? This, this is just stuff like as life was happening, how we were just stepping up. Is this like the Jesus life? Yes. This is what Jesus did. They just go about doing good and setting all who were oppressed the devil free. Yeah. Okay. Acts 10 38. Check this out. I went with a friend and we prayed for a guy who had always been dead. A young boy, he was eight years old, I think, 16, somewhere around there. He was young. And we prayed eight times. Now, most of you I know you would have done a better job, but you weren't there, so I had to do it. <laughs> I prayed eight times. I remember the seventh time my friend looked at me and he said, Are you sure? And I said, Man, this thing's going and it's going now. Let's do this. And we did it. And the thing is, and that boy's ears opened for the first time. He didn't even understand what sound sounded like. He was completely confused. But it was such a pleasure to hear a report from my friend that when he phoned him later on, he heard him and he could speak back to him. Isn't it amazing? Are you ready for this kind of life, man? This is what I'm setting you up for. You're going to like charge the gates of hell. They cannot prevail because you're the church. Come on, you're the church, man. 
You're the pride of Christ. You're a warrior princess. You're going to make this thing happen. Yeah. Why? Because we are hastening the day of the Lord. We've got no time to waste. Yes. Amen? Amen? Come on. Oh, yeah. So my one friend, he came up for prayer. He had this pain in his stomach. And I'm not too sure how it originated, but basically it's just like this constant pain that wouldn't go away. Prayed for him, and we prayed a couple of times, and instantly it got healed. Right? One time we prayed, instantly went away, and never came back again. I went to Cape Town, and there was a lady there whose daughter um, was allergic to nuts. Now, how many of you know that a nut allergy is quite a dangerous thing normally? Yeah. yeah. How many of you know that? Anaphylactic shock. Okay? Now I want to show you. This lady, her daughter would go into anaphylactic shock if she had nuts. Guess what she did? She ended up carrying a needle with adrenaline in it, right? Well, I prayed for her. And I said, now, go and eat nuts. And she's like, are you sure? And I said, man, it's what the Word of God says. Go do it. So she did it. And guess what? Completely healed. Wow. Isn't it amazing? That that is what Jesus has done through me. And that's only scratching the top of the iceberg. 